Welcome back. You know, all week long in a special RFL investigation, we are going to be focusing on the issue of hydrofracking. Now, even if you don't know anything about the process, which is a way to drill for natural gas, you probably heard about some of the intense controversy and the passionate debate on both sides of the issue. Now, supporters of hydrofracking believe it will not only provide a solution to the country's energy problems, but they say it just might put a dent in the national job crisis as well. Opponents, they say, no, the process, it is so dangerous that it's poisoning the drinking water supply, making it so toxic you could literally light the water from your kitchen faucet on fire. Well, in New York State here, Governor Cuomo, he's opened the door to hydrofracking, but regulators in the state, they're taking a very hard look at the neighbors in Pennsylvania. Now, it's its third year of drilling there, and they're hoping to avoid some of the pitfalls that some argue Pennsylvania made with its drill first, think later philosophy. Now, I want to bring in our reporter on this, Kim Lengel. She's led this special investigation since the very beginning. Kim? That's right, Rich. And there is a lot of excitement behind natural gas drilling. Some are comparing it to a modern-day gold rush. Hydrofracking is actually not new to New York. These kinds of wells have been drilled here for years, but what is new is the scale of drilling that's now being proposed. State environmental officials are getting ready to work on the final phase of a plan to allow hydrofracking in New York State. It's been so controversial, the agency was crushed with an unprecedented 61,000 public comments. The huge response has forced the agency to slow its pace, and now the reality of the number of permits that could be issued is ever shrinking. We wanted to find out more. We wanted to know what the natural gas drilling is like in Pennsylvania, and we wanted to get the facts behind the process. What we're seeing in Susquehanna County is the sweetest spot in the Marcellus. Cabot has 16 of the top 20 wells producing, and they're all in Susquehanna County. Natural gas deposits across the U.S. are overwhelmingly abundant. Energy experts believe these deposits hold the equivalent of two Saudi Arabia's worth of oil in the form of natural gas. Here in the Northeast, the natural gas formation known as the Marcellus Shale extends deep underground from Ohio and West Virginia, northeast into Pennsylvania and southern New York. Geologists estimate that the entire Marcellus Shale may contain close to 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It's not yet known how much gas will be commercially recoverable in New York, but geologists think it's about 500 times the amount that New York currently uses in a year. This is a true gift, and we're blessed to have it here from the nation's overall standpoint, from electric generation, natural gas vehicles, but also for those landowners who happen to be the owners who are seeing those royalties. Cabot Oil & Gas is one of the leading natural gas drilling companies in the country. Between 2008 and 2011, Cabot spent close to $1.5 billion in Susquehanna County alone for things like equipment, land leases, bonuses, and taxes. Cabot paid millions of dollars in royalties to county landowners for the right to drill on their property and extract natural gas. In 2010, Cabot paid back in royalties $43 million to the landowners. In 2011, that number was closer to $65 million. In Susquehanna County, where drilling rigs have yeah. changed the landscape of this once picturesque farming county, gas pads are also now popping up in some areas advocacy groups have called risky. We're actually on property that is owned by the school. This is a completed pad site. Yes, this is a site that has been fully reclaimed as we are bringing the gas to the surface. So you're saying there's natural gas flowing through here? Yes. The natural gas that's now being brought to the surface on the property of Elk Lake School District has earned the district a million dollars in royalties. According to Cabot, the size of this production pad, about half an acre, is typical for the final stage of hydrofracking. But it pales in comparison to the acreage and resources required for drilling and fracking. What you're seeing here, Kim, is active drilling. It's loud. But what you're also hearing here is the diesel that is used to run all the equipment. This unto itself is its own little city. This has a 20 to 24 workers 24 hours a day. This rig runs off of diesel, so you're really hearing the generators to produce the power. The drilling unto itself, the drill bit, 
you don't hear. Over 5,000 feet of steel piping and concrete will be used to drill down into the earth at this particular site, what locals call the Hess Farm. Cabot provides this animation on its website. For the rest of the process, you cannot see the drilling and subsequent fracking that happens underground. We generally go between 8,000 and 10,000 feet, and then we do the kickoff. The kickoff point is when we start to turn the pipe. That turn takes about a quarter of a mile, and then we go out horizontally. Horizontally, we go out about four to 5,000 feet. So truly, if you would imagine, from here, we'd be going out one, one mile out. We're two miles down, and then we're going out one mile. It typically takes Cabot 25 days to drill a well, and multiple wells are typically drilled at each site. When drilling is finished, the equipment is taken away, and the site, which looks like this, is now ready for fracking. Now we will bring the necessary equipment to come on, create the pressure to send water and sand down, fracture this Marcellus, and then bring the gas up. Once the gas is brought to the surface, what we saw at Elk Lake was that pad site that's complete. Opponents of fracking have criticized the industry, claiming it's not being honest about the potential dangers of natural gas drilling. They argue that if fracking is safe, the industry would disclose exactly what's in the fracking fluid that they shoot into the ground. According to the industry, fracking fluid is typically 98 to 99.5 percent water and sand with chemical additives making up the remainder. The issue is what's in the other 1 percent. Opponents call it a toxic cocktail of chemicals. Some companies, including Cabot, have voluntarily listed the chemicals most often used in fracking. On the website, frackfocus.org, you'll find that some of the chemicals include hydrochloric acid, methanol, and ethylene glycol. And that, critics say, is the problem. They believe those potentially dangerous chemicals can, and in some cases do, wind up in the drinking water supply. When the fracking fluid passes the drinking water supply, it's supposed to be contained within at least two layers of steel and two layers of cement. Industry admits there can be problems if there are flaws in the casing, but industry says those accidents are rare. According to a study published last year, scientists at MIT documented at least 50 hydrofracking incidents nationwide between 2005 and 2009, including accidents, contamination, spills, air quality problems and well blowouts. Now it's as we mentioned before it's unclear when and to what extent environmental officials in New York will begin permitting for natural gas drilling. They have the benefit of seeing what's been happening in other states and as they told us they're paying very close attention. Now on Thursday we're going to talk about the plan that New York State has drafted and we're also going to hear from the state's top environmental official the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. You know, as we obviously saw you spend some time in Pennsylvania, Tana Dimmick here. Um, a lot of people talk about back and forth. More than the officials, you talk to the people also. I'm curious, how, how do they feel about fracking? Well, it's, it's a mixed, very complicated issue. And as we spoke to, to people, they have very strong feelings on both sides. And we'll get into that tomorrow. But overwhelmingly, as we found out, people feel that the gas companies and the state regulators, the ones who are supposed to keep them safe, aren't giving them all the information they need to feel comfortable with this technology. We saw some of that ourselves during our trip. What you're about to see happened on the property of an elementary school school, the Elk Lake School District, where there's a gas well in its final stage. If you picture this, the natural gas is surfacing and is being collected right before it goes into production. Take a look. This is a completed pad site. Yes, this is a site that has been fully reclaimed as we are bringing the gas to the surface. We're actually on property that is owned by the school. Uh, they're probably uh, have seen upwards of a million dollars in royalties for their property that's in this unit. I smell something. You would smell the methane. That's methane? Yes. They say, is there a chemical mixed with the methane? There, you do have mercaptan mixed into it, which should not be uh, in it here. So that's a good question as to what it is you're actually smelling. There. So would you typically smell that? Uh, in typically. This area? In, on this, this close to the site, yes, on the location like this. So that smell is normal. Describe what that smell is. What, what am I smelling? 
I probably can't describe. Sorry. Um, Just sort of a chemical, gassy smell. Yeah. Yeah. Now we called Cabot Oil and Gas to find out exactly what we smelled at the Elk Lake School. They said they do not know what the odor was. They say it was not methane and it was not mercaptan, which is a chemical added to natural gas to help you detect gas leaks. They said they wanted us to point out that the odor was small and localized and they say students at the school cannot, cannot or ever could smell it. Rich? Okay, now I'm trying to put myself in that town and you got an elementary school. Pretend it's my kid there for a minute. Sounds like it's a community that could use some money, right? But you're really making a very expensive gamble here. You know, you're putting in something that people have a lot of open-ended questions about. You raised a lot in your piece, but on the same end, there's money that's coming in. It was obviously a strong enough order that you didn't have to try too hard to, you know, figure out. Right? I have never been on a drilling rig or or a gas well production pad, and I noticed the smell. Uh, it was small and localized, like they said, uh, maybe five to ten feet from the pipes. You couldn't smell it, but I smelled it. And they say there's nothing wrong with it. There's no harm in it. And you're right with the playground there, uh, right in eyesight, right? All right. Now, we are going to be bringing you special reports on this very controversial drilling method all throughout the week here. And then come Thursday, we have assembled some of the leading experts on this, environmentalists, a few famous faces as well to help us shed more light on what will be, trust me, an extremely contentious issue in our region this year, giving you pretty much a preview on what you're going to expect here between now and the end of the calendar year. Now, when we come back, we're going to hear from an engineer who helped develop fracturing techniques more than 25 years ago, a relative pioneer when it comes to hydrofracking. But here's the kicker. Today, he says the industry has become too risky, and it's taking the hydrofracking to the extreme. Stay with us. We'll be right back.